great to see you both. Yeah. You know, it's a cool thing to be in a room with people who get it. Yeah, and we've kind of only met on the computer screen. And so now it's like real and in person. And getting to understand and help other people understand what we have gone through and how we can move forward and create this tribe, basically. Tribe is a good word. Yeah. People that hang together and learn from each other. Exactly. Yeah. A community of survivors coming yes. together for one purpose, even if our stories are different. Yes. How do you feel about that word survivors? I like it a lot better than victim. I agree. You know, yeah. I and mean, even in the very early stages when it's like your head's exploding, you still survived, right? Right, right. But I feel like now on my journey, I love like thriver or like that next step. Um, but I think early on survivor rather than victim was always something I identified with more. And I think people should see that that's the journey that we take. For me, it's been 20 years since I started my healing journey. Some things that worked back then don't serve me well now. <laughs> and things that serve me well now, would I would not have even thought of back then. Um, so, you know, definitely um, finding my voice was huge and that has carried throughout. When I first found my voice in a very small um, space of like a court case and I kind of had to mm. speak about things um, and then it kind of transformed into, I get to choose to speak about it. And, and that's power. That's taking back your power and say, I will say this when I want to. It's like 40 years for me. And what I reached out to were other people, um, support groups. You know, back then they had um, su support groups for survivors and just sitting in those rooms. And it, it made me want to cry hearing the stories, but it also made me feel like I'm not alone. Yeah, what would you say, John Michael, about Well, I, I didn't find my voice until about five years ago. And I did it kind of in a, a, an odd way. I did it publicly on a TED Talk. Ah, wow. And so that's when I felt power that I was taking it back. And it was incredible because my situation started at 14 all the way through high school. I normalized so much just to survive, just to get through the day. You know, how how did I take these things that were happening, make them okay, just to get through? And it wasn't until later on, things started getting worse and worse without realizing it. I certainly normalize it because mine started before I can remember in, in the crib. And so that was just life. And so I went through and I, I was just, this is what fathers do, I guess. You know, it's, I'm a good girl. It wasn't until I got to veterinary school, I got in my first choice and I thought I should be happy and I was not. And I'm thinking, what's wrong with me? You know, why am I not happy? And then all this stuff, it all started happening right around that time. And I'm like, oh, oh, I can't pretend anymore. When I was 14, I, I took eighth at the Junior Olympics and a lawyer contacted my mother. And that's how this all began. And it was about, th they, they presented it. This is this incredible opportunity for you. You just have to deal. You have to, you have to pay the price to be this elite athlete. I do remember trying to speak to someone and I chose my mother. And when I told her, I remember her looking at me and saying, oh, and you know, she got really serious. And then she slapped me across the face and said, you know, uh, you, you shouldn't make lies up about people. If anything happened, you must have done it yourself. I don't know how many times people thought, well, you were abused by a man and you're gay, so you must have enjoyed it. That was the biggest thing with oh, me. Oh, yes. I wanted it, which made me hate my body. Yeah, I mean, I am very grateful to say that my parents believed me. It was outside the family. Um, but what was even more difficult was, I mean, I was in middle school, high school, my peers. Mm. Um, I had a peer say to me once, you know, um, if you talk about it so much, so I found my voice, if you talk about it so much, you must have liked it. And so that, that was a deep seated lie that I continued to carry with me as I kind of, kind of fought the grain by speaking out. So what was like the first thing that you noticed that started happening that helped you? I like logic. Mm -hmm. I'm a scientist, right? And it was very logical that I wouldn't feel good after going through something that I shouldn't have gone through and never telling anyone. Oh, this makes sense. This is what happened. That explains all these other feelings. Oh, 
Yeah. And we hear it a lot. Healing is not linear. Um, and, you know, I just picture that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, and I think that's been something I've held on to because I think there is a pressure sometimes to be like, okay, you've like done it. You've done the healing work. You've spoken out about it, like be done with it. And I think for me, it's been so powerful and important and even crucial to embody that healing is not linear um, because it has come back at different like milestones in my life. I got married in 2022. I had a baby in 2023. And so, you know, just things that I never thought possible because of my abuse. But there are some things that, you know, that may stay open ended for us that have closed for other people. Mm -hmm. And I think honoring those both both of those things um, is so important. Um, and letting people know that there's no pressure to be healed. Do you even know what kind of person you would have been without the abuse? I think about that often. Yeah, this is a constant growth that we're talking about, and it's something that's really can be overwhelming. It's helping me to talk to you. Oh my God, I was just thinking <laughs> yeah. the same thing. What would you say to a young person who may be experiencing wondering if they have been abused or make it even a a little bit different, what would you say to yourself at the time? You, little girl, do not deserve to be treated this way. There is nothing you ever could have done to make this okay. I think that is going to be one, like to think about my daughter and how, you know, um, you know, I really pray that there's no story when she's, you know, 12 years old, right, right. Um, nine years old, you know, whatever it is. So the, the looking forward um, to, to kind of coming face to face with my childhood self through my daughter, um, it's, it's on the shelf right now, but I think it's, um, it's a powerful thing to kind of, you know, prepare for. So John, Michael, what are some of the things that if you could, that you would tell yourself? I hear you, I believe you, and, and I, I love you which is something I think that he needed so much because he didn't know what love was. He, he, he didn't know what trust was. Boundaries are still being formed and shored up, but they're ones of my own choosing this time and I can see through them. There are windows instead of doors. These spaces of survivor solidarity and owning our stories and sharing them with each other um, is just, you know, I'm kind of in awe of, you know, the conversations that we've had here today. This is not the end. I'm so excited to have spent this time with you. It's just been wonderful. It's, it's been, been an incredible, incredible day. Yeah. yeah. yeah.